Hello and welcome everybody to the Charlie Chats Footy podcast with me, Charlie Casson. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is episode 13. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm absolutely buzzing. I don't know if any of you saw on the weekend, but uh, the mighty Barnet FC beat Yeovil 2 0 away in a one off playoff final eliminator to set up a tie with Notts County, which is tomorrow at five o'clock on BT Sport. One legged game doesn't go to uh, extra time, straight to penalties, and the winner will face either Borehamwood or Halifax at Wembley. So I am absolutely buzzing. Can't believe we won last week. We didn't deserve it at all, but uh, we rode our luck and uh, hopefully, hopefully we get to, well, you know what? It's so annoying because I've waited, what, 20 years? I waited about 20 years to see Barnet at Wembley and the one year that it could potentially happen, which we'll find out tomorrow night about six o'clock, we can't go. No one can go, but it's fine. I'm not getting FOMO. It'd be different if I couldn't go because I was on holiday or had work or something. So uh, I'm, I've not got FOMO or anything, which is good. But yeah, fingers crossed we get there. Um, and yeah, cheer us on. Watch out for the bees. We're going to be taking over Nottingham, hopefully, come Saturday night. This is episode 13. Like I said, we've got two more guests after this. So we're going to wrap it up for season one after episode 15. I've got a DJ on next week, a uh, brilliant DJ um, who I'm a big fan of. And to wrap up the series, we've got an actor who I won't give too much away, but um, great actor, lovely bloke. And he is a huge, huge football fan. I won't tell you who he supports yet because it might give it away. This week, though, it's episode 13. It is with my good friend and fantastic actor, Jacob Scipio. Jacob has just hit our screens in the Hollywood blockbuster film Bad Boys for Life alongside Will Smith and Martin Lawrence which I'm very proud of him for um, he absolutely smashes it in the movie if you haven't seen it get on it now Jacob gives a wicked performance as always and the movie's a classic so in this episode we talk about growing up around football we talk about Jacob's love for Tottenham Hotspur and his earliest memories as a Spurs fan he tells me an amazing story about the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, which saw him and his brother Zach have a truly unforgettable night in the Copacabana Palace in Brazil. I won't say any more on that. Just make sure you're tuned in and listening to this. We talk about Tottenham Hotspur's famous Champions League run a couple of seasons ago, which footballer Jacob would play in a movie about their life, and much, much more. Please give it a share, subscribe, like, post it anywhere. So yeah, I'd much appreciate that if you could all do that for me. Uh, if you're enjoying it, of course. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, jump on there, give it a little review, uh, give it a little rating. Really, really helps with, you know, um, catapulting the podcast into into Apple's feed and stuff. So every little help. I'm very excited. I'm going to have a month off after episode 15. Sit down, get everything together for season two, get together some guests. If you want to request anyone, if there's anyone out there that you want to hear on this podcast, um, get in touch with me. Drop me a message, drop me an email, and I'll do my best to get them on. I've got some people in the pipeline, but uh, I'm always open to hearing suggestions. So yeah, jump on uh, Twitter or email or Instagram and give me a shout. But for now, this is episode 13 of the Charlie Chats Footy Podcast with Jacob Scipio. Enjoy. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this new episode. I'm sat here with my very dear friend, Jacob Scipio. Jacob, how you doing, mate? I'm very good, thank you, mate. I'm very well. I'm happy to be here. You're a massive Tottenham fan, yeah? I am, definitely. A huge Tottenham fan. I've been a Spurs fan all my life. Tell us about your first football memory that you remember. My, my earliest footballing memories were going to watch my dad play football and my big brother play football. They just we used to play Sunday League, but we they uh, used to drive to South London every morning. We used to get up well early, driving through South London, and yeah, we'd, we'd me and my brothers that would go and watch them play like every week, week for like our whole childhood, and it was like an extended crash because all the kids from all the <laughs> other players would be there too, and like we'd have no one watching over us. Well, we'd have the subs watching over us, but they're concentrating on the game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it was uh, very fond memories of that man. So football was always kind of embedded 
into my brain from a young age. We had all my brothers and my dad's trophies up on up in our front room and all the signed footballs that my mum collected uh, throughout the years next to them and memorabilia were uh, obviously my 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 mum's uncle is is um is Dave Sexton who managed Chelsea and Manchester United and England under 21 so we're a big uh, uh, football crazy in my family so that's my earliest memories are just just that my earliest memories man so why Tottenham Hotspur <laughs> why not <laughs> how, <laughs> someone's going <laughs> how long yeah yeah how long have you got <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer is my dad supported them my dad came from Guyana when he was three years old and they moved to Tottenham and they 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 he, he spent his whole you know childhood and teenage years growing up in, in Tottenham so it is he didn't really have a choice that was his local team and he chose them and it was passed down to me from a very, from, from birth. I, could, I didn't really have a choice, man. Grew up in, you know, East Finchley. So I have a lot of people in my area or Arsenal fans. Yeah. Um, but not once did it cross my mind to <clears> even dare, even dare support Arsenal. Um, it was always going to be Spurs. Um, I think I made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember like when you was a kid? Did you used to like bop around in the in the Tottenham kit when you were little? Yeah, I used to. I used to. I used to have the, the Spurs kits, and I used to have Barcelona kits because I loved Barcelona as well. Um, I just I loved the kits. I loved the players, and so those are my two kind of like favorite teams growing up. I also like Blackburn for some reason. I don't know why. Blackburn. <laughs> yeah, bro. So random. Where's that come e- from? I don't even know if I've watched a Blackburn game in my life. <laughs> Um, I don't know what it was. I can't, like I cannot tell you why Blackburn, but I think for a season I was a Blackburn fan. As Mate, well. I got something <laughs> similar. My dad, t- my dad told me there was one game. I think it was Barnsley Sheffield Wednesday or something, and Barnsley were winning. And I told my dad I want to be a Barnsley fan. <laughs> just because they winning. A, yeah, it's just these random things you do as a kid. Sometimes it's got no explanation for. But um, yeah, obviously it was always Spurs. That you know, those those were just flirtations uh, as as a young child. Didn't know any better, but um, it's all, it's always been Spurs. At at that age, growing up, mm. when you were when were you old enough to to like realize you know who the Tottenham players are and who were the who were the players around that time? The earliest kind of players I remember is like Teddy Sheringham, my 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 older brother. Um, a few years older than me, you know, he was, always, again, always been a Spurs fan, but his players would have been like, you know, Gary Lineker and Gaza and all that, all them, all them kind of amazing players there. So it's, like I say, man, it's always been there in the back of my mind growing up. And I, I couldn't even pinpoint one particular time where it was like, mm-hmm. I've arrived as a Spurs fan. Because even as a kid, not really even understanding the deeper, um, intricacies of the game you're always still cheering when your team scores or when you know you win a game and you're always upset when they lose so there was never really a a time where I was like yeah now I'm definitely a Spurs fan and I know what's happening it just gradually kind of happened you know what I mean who if you had to pinpoint one player for you who is Spurs's all-time greatest player in your lifetime in my lifetime. In your lifetime, yeah. Jeez, it's, 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 it's a current one, but just for his pure goal-scoring ability, you know, his leadership qualities, his all-round game, it's got to be Harry Kane. Mm. Um, he's just top, top, top class. He's world-class striker. He's, you know, he's Spurs through and through. I think Harry Kane is the best Spurs player I've ever seen play, yeah. you know. Um, he's that touch a, above, isn't he? Yeah, he's just, he's, he's got it all because, you know, he comes across as a friendly guy, but he's got a bit of the dark arts in him, which you want to see in a striker. He's got that edge to him where he will bully up a defender and he'll use his body and he'll get physical, but his footballing intelligence is just so far ahead from, uh, from, from, you know, a lot of strikers. And he doesn't seem to get rattled ever. Like, I don't think I've seen Harry Kane, someone get into Harry Kane's head. 
a defend you know what I mean because a lot of defending is uh is mind games mm. so so striking you know what I mean a lot of it is mind games you mm. try to get into their head so you can beat them that way if they 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 got they got you on the pace you know you got to give them a yard but you'll be in their ear any and every opportunity you get to try and break them down that's what I do anyway but um <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can do because uh, <laughs> I'm definitely not good and I definitely wouldn't stand a chance against Harry Kane um, I was going to ask you I was going to ask when you mentioned your brother playing and stuff did you ever play when you was younger? yeah we'd be kicking the balls against the, the garage doors while they were all playing and getting in loads of trouble because we'd always kick the ball onto the pitch while it's in play do you know what I mean? was you a bit of a baller? no I've never a baller <laughs> no, no tech no tech Zero tech, <laughs> but I had but I had a lot of heart. <laughs> I had a lot of heart, and I had a big engine. So my dad used to call me a tugboat. So because you know I wasn't the quickest, I wasn't the most skillful, but I was strong. Yeah, it was like playing defence. You know what I mean? And I had a left, I'm left footed, so I played left back. You know what I mean? And also, you know, there's not really a lot of uh, competition when you're trying to get in a squad. You usually, you, you might usually get in the game if you're, if you're a fullback, <laughs> if you're a half decent one. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I landed. You know, and I was never. Both of my brothers were really good. Uh, my oldest brother that like, played semi-pro, and my other brother was just na- Zach. That was naturally gifted footballer. Mm. He was a winger. My dad was a striker. He was always top goal scorer for his, you know, Sunday league teams for years and years. So they were all, I think the footballing skills got blessed and they got blessed with those. And I just, I always wanted to play because they played. But mm-hmm. then and that was it in the beginning. And, you know, you're always kicking the ball around in the garden with your brothers or whatever. Like I said, it's always been a part of our life. But um, as the, you know, the more you grow up and the more you play, the more you love the game, man. And Every opportunity I get to play, if there's a game going, I'll I'll travel to wherever just to have a kick about yeah. because it's just I don't know, man. There's something about being on that pitch where you forget about everything, don't you? For mm. for those 45, 90 minutes, whatever it may be, it releases but, yeah, something, doesn't it? It it does, man. It's a it's a strange thing to put into words, but you just it's properly therapeutic. Some games, some games, you, 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 your blood is up and you're getting into beef and you're just, <laughs> you're wishing, <laughs> you're wishing you didn't like do that challenge or, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> wishing, you did, wishing you didn't go to South London. <laughs> wishing you didn't travel. Now I've got the, now I've got to get the train back, you know what I mean? And we've lost and it's raining, but no, nah, it's always worth it. The game's always worth it because, you know, you're going to be better in yourself every time, hopefully. Yeah. You mentioned at the start, your mum, I know your mum, your mum, Sally. Um, yeah. You obviously mentioned her brother being Dave Sexton and... Oh, uh, yeah, her uncle. Her uncle, sorry. Her uncle yeah, being yeah. Dave Sexton and like her bringing back memorabilia, like the football, signed footballs and stuff. It was mm. always, in your, always in your life from an early age. Now, yeah. I know your mum now. She works, she works behind the scenes, makeup artist to the stars. Yes. yes tell, us, t- tell us a bit about that. Tell us a bit about your, what your mum does and how that sort of like influenced you growing up and if you ever got to like go work with her or whatever. Yeah, well, mum was, um, mum's been a makeup artist her whole life for the majority of her career in sport. So she'd be doing everything from boxing to Formula One to football. Um, but her main kind of job uh, was the uh, was match of the day. She did um, the makeup on the pundits for match of the day for about, I don't know, like 10, 15 years. More recently, she works with um, BT Sport. So she does all the games. She covers, you know, everything from the Champions League final to the World Cup. I mean, it's just an absolute dream job because you get to travel all over the world. Uh, you get to stay in these amazing uh, locations, like wherever the wherever the location of the World Cup or Euros or Champions League may be. And you get to be backstage and, and watch the game. And obviously she's working, but it's just an amazing uh, amazing job and I've been lucky enough to go on a few uh, of the of, of the tournaments with her not not the whole time but usually join her around the end when it's the finals and semi-finals because she has a bit more time off so we get to spend time together but you know we also get to go backstage and meet the pundits and where's the best place you've been to visit her it's got to be Brazil it's got to well, be Rio World de Janeiro Cup. World Cup final Rio de Janeiro mate it was what was that like? So it's the day before 
um, we're supposed to fly out, me and my brother, Zach, and we're watching the semi-final, Brazil, Germany. In London? In London. We're just at the pub. We're watching it. We're gassed. We're excited. Flights booked. We've got our passports, bags packed. We're just at the pub having a couple drinks, watching Brazil, Germany. Brilliant, you know, matchup for this World Cup semi-final. And we're rooting for Brazil the whole way because we're going there tomorrow. So the game starts and I'm watching a good friend of mine who's a, a Brazilian guy is watching it with us. He's come in with his, Bra- his huge Brazil flag, flag um, wrapped around his neck like he's a fanatic, right, for his team. And, you know, game starts, five, ten minutes go in, Brazil concede. Then I think they concede at like the 20th minute. Then they concede again in the 22nd. And they concede again in the 24th. Then they concede again in the 26th. I think it was like, they were like four or five nil down within the first half an hour. And I just remember my friend, the Brazilian standing up and he shouts to the whole pub, this is a fucking disgrace. <laughs> like that. And he just <laughs> walks. He leaves. He left. He left, he left the, no. the semifinals. He left the pub because obviously like you'd never expected this in your entire life. This In their backyard as well. In their own backyard. So I'm looking at Zach and Zach, my brother and he's looking at me and we're just thinking, wow, we got to go here tomorrow. <laughs> it, wasn't, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't just like, you know, a tough break. It was like a thrashing which they got um, by at the hands of the Germans. So we had to go there. And what made it even worse was Argentina had got through to the final. And the Brazilians and Argentinians, obviously, they've got their, um, they've got their beef. Um, that would have been some so fun that in Brazil. That, yeah, so that's what we were thinking. So obviously, it's Germany, Brazil in the final. But we get there, we arrive, and we're thinking the mood is just going to be so somber and it's, you know, it's going to be ruined. But we get there, and man, oh man. Like if anyone who's been to Rio de Janeiro and gone to the Copacabana Beach or Ipanema, it's just like... It's heaven. You really feel, and I'm I'm South American. My dad's South American. So when you when I got there, I thought like I'm home. I felt like I've arrived home, even though I'd never been. But yeah. you know, once once your toes are in the sand and you walk down the beach, and they all play football, men, women, uh, children. What, whatever age you are, they're all doing keepy uppies together in a circle and they're using all of their bodies. They're using their shoulders and their chest and their feet and they're doing just kick-ups. And there's about, you look down the beach, I think I've got this video of it, and you look down the beach and there's about 100,000 people on the beach all playing football. And that just wow. gives you an idea of what the vibe was like out there. It's incredible. I remember walking down the beach and they play like volleyball, but with their feet, with no hands basically with everything but their hands and then and it's this game kicking off and there's a few people like surrounding it and cheering and I'm like oh that was going on and we walk over and there's this one guy who's like really good like he's like doing bicycle kicks and kick-ups and scoring bare points and I look a bit closer and I'm like, oh my god that's Varon and Varon's wow. just out there playing on the beach with a bunch of uh locals man it was just no like, I was like Oh my days, this is... Did he still have a bit of it, yeah? He still had a bit. Of course, we never yeah. lose it. You never lose it. But um, the, with Brazil, man, we were there. We were obviously there for the final. And we, it was my brother's birthday. So my mum got me and him, This pre, the, the present was we got to go to the Copacabana Palace. She couldn't get us tickets to the final, obviously, because they're like, it's like the hottest ticket in the world. And I think the people that she works with get like free tickets for the entire company. So we, we couldn't get any, but we got the next best thing. We were at the Copacabana Palace, which is just right on the beach. It's this historic, beautiful, old um, Brazilian hotel. So we get in, we sit down in the gardens and there's this huge TV there, TV's there. There's a, there's a few people there, but like not a lot. So you, you're not comfortable. And it was just this bottomless champagne brunch, which we had basically. So me and my brother were just sitting there watching the World Cup final in the Copacabana Palace with unlimited champagne. Oh my and God. I think we were the only ones in the whole place who had this deal because 
after one bottle comes and another bottle comes, people start looking over at us like, who the hell are these guys? Because, you know, they're just sipping their drinks, eating their lovely brunch, whatever it is. It's a little bit highfalutin in there. It's not really like your local yeah, beer yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, it was a bit swanky. So, like, the more drinks that come, the more, you know, swivy we're getting and the, <laughs> and the more we're talking and the more we're shouting and the more we're, like, getting the vibe up in the room and people start, like, following suit. And there was this guy across the table from us and he must have been, I don't know, but he just ended up coming over to the table and taking our champagne bottle and like drinking out of the bottle and, sh- and, and like, and like bantering us in Argentinian. We were just bantering back in English <laughs> and just having a good time. And by the end of it, we were just getting everyone smashed because we had all this champagne. So we were just handing it out to everyone and just basically made everyone have a big party in the middle of the Copacabana Palace. It, it got real, man. It got real, really quickly. So Germany wins and I'm looking outside my window to the Gobo Cabana Palace and there's like 80,000 Argentina fans on the street. Like, I'm like, oh shit, this is going to kick off. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't like that at all. It was like good vibes. And then all of a sudden they, the crowd starts parting and I realise they're parting because there's all these sirens coming toward us. And it's like this whole police convoy is coming. It's like breaking through the crowd but they're coming in our direction and all these cars pull in to the Copacabana Palace and all these people get out and we're like holy shit like, who are these guys so there's a little bit of uh, commotion going on in the palace with me and my brother thinking what's happening here I was like we're we supposed to be here right now anyway in walks the German team with the World Cup trophy no way Their after party, (laughs) after winning the World Cup, was where we were. It was just dumb luck that we were there. So we end up, obviously, we're like, you know, we're already partying because of the whole champagne situation. Everybody else is loving us in there. So we're thinking, let's just stay. (laughs) We end up, like, having drinks with the German squad because (laughs) we're just at their after party. And I'm seeing the World Cup. (laughs) <laughs> trophy just over there and then Rihanna comes in and I'm like what what is going on where am I right now <laughs> it was one that's like a dream bro. it was literally like a dream and then my mum calls me and she's like where are you guys I'm like mum you'll never guess what, what's happening right now we're still at the palace the German squad are here and Rihanna and all trophy and all this stuff she's like oh, that's brilliant stay there stay there I'm like why where are you she was like oh we're just it's um we're back at the hotel where we're staying and everybody's over here because it's Alan, it's Alan Hansen's last um, commentary tournament. From, from match of the day. It's his last tournament and everyone's having his leaving party. But don't worry, stay with the Germans. And we were like, we're not going to stay with a German team. We're coming. So then we left there and we ended up going to just a much smaller hotel on the beach with like the people who work at the BBC and Alan Hansen and Gary Lineker and, Rio Ferdinand's DJing in this little booth and we we're just having a couple of drinks on on the beach man and honestly like they were equally as good parties both of them because they're just such good vibes and good people man so that was I don't know I, I don't know if I can ever top that I'll certainly try but as a, as a World Cup experience you know what that, a night that, mate that was, that was the top of the top definitely that's that's definitely something you're going to tell your grandkids in years to come for sure, man. You're, it's mad because I follow your I follow your mum on Instagram, and I yeah. always see like I'll just be scrolling through my Instagram on like a Tuesday, and I'll just see like <laughs> Sally's uploaded a photo just chilling with Alan Shearer like at the new <laughs> camp or something. <laughs> it's like such a crazy job, man. I, I want to yeah, do her man. job. I want to I want to do I my know. makeup artist training. You and me both, bro. Listen, you can get a little bit of makeup artist training, and we'll see if we can't get you a little um. A little internship. <laughs> <laughs> just be touching up like Owen Hargreaves' face. <laughs> oh, mate, that's class. What a story that is. Let's move on now. Let's talk about more recent times. Mm. <clears throat> I want to talk about, in particular, a very, very iconic and special period in Spurs' history. Mm-hmm. Um, last season's Champions League campaign. Yes. So I want to touch, I want to, I want to skip, I want to skip through the group stages, skip through all of that. And uh-huh. I, let's just touch on first that crazy, crazy game against Man City at the Etihad. Boy. 
mate, I'm an, as a neutral, that is probably because I think, wasn't it 2 2 in the 10th minute or something? It was, I, uh, bruv, it was such an emotional roller coaster for me that I think, as hard as I've tried, I've just like, not scrubbed from my memory, but it was just, I just remember going through the motions of that game and being like, going from hopeless to like, oh shit, we've got a chance. Did it, we, we drew it, did it? No, we lost. We drew, I can't even. We, no, it was the, se- it was the, se- it wasn't it the second leg. And it was the second leg. All I somehow, remember was. Somehow, somehow we lost, drew and won at the same time because we lost the game. We drew on aggregate, but we won because of away goals. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> but it was it was because Lorente scored that goal that everyone thought yeah, was a handball. Yeah, of a handball. Yeah, yeah, it came off his hip. And then, so you were going through the whole time, and then last second, Sterling scored. Sterling, but it, but, then, but but VIR looked at, and then you got that hilarious thing of Pep falling to his knees and like grabbing his head. Yeah, <laughs> I could not I believe was, it because I was just going to say like the first, t- it was two two in the eleventh minute. It was two two because Son, I think they Son scored. Then Sterling equalised, and then Son scored again, and then in the eleventh minute, Bernardo Silva scored, and it was two all in the tenth minute. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? I was in Mexico for was that game. I was shooting like the last um, couple days of Bad Boys, and I had a day off, and I had this security guard with me because they thought I, I was important enough that I needed personal security with me. So this guy, the security, close security guy called Aggie, was just like taking me around Mexico. So we went to like this church. I saw, I did like all the tourist stuff. I was like, yeah, this is great, it's awesome. We got a blessing from an Aztec wizard where they like put sage all over you and like give you a blessing and stuff. It was awesome. Then I realized, oh shit, Spurs are playing. Like, can we go see it? It was like, yeah, of course. So we were late to the game, bro. That's, that's what happened. We, we, I, I didn't get there for kickoff. And I arrived and it was like, yeah, all the goals had been scored already. I was like, I've missed the best half an hour of football. Yeah. I think I would have ever seen in my life. <laughs> How the hell has there already been this many goals? But yeah, then uh, we, we, we got through it. We got through it in the end, man. Just as you think it couldn't get any more bonkers. <sighs> I, I'm I, I'm not even a Spurs fan, but still to this day, it makes me speechless. And I watch it over and over again. That replay, that second leg in Amsterdam semi-final. More of us. It is the most. It's the craziest semi-final I've seen ever. Go on, go on. Explain it from as a Spurs fan. Like explain well, that night. First of all, Mora will go down in Spurs legend for the rest of his career. He doesn't have to do anything else after what he did in that game, in my opinion, he's just a little dancer. He just, he just took the game by the scruff of his neck and refused to lie down, man. He's, he was brilliant. So, um, it was, going into the, going into that game, they beat you at White Hart Lane. They had, it, One and, nil, and, yeah. and then they scored the first goal. It was the, um, it was the, the lit, the defender. He scored yeah. a header, didn't he? They, and then they scored again. There was two nil up at half time. So they yeah. you go into you, you come out the second half three nil down on aggregate, knowing mm-hmm. the only way you're going to the final is if you score mm-hmm. three. I'm sitting in a bar in LA because I was in LA at the time. It was like twelve o'clock or whatever it would would be because of the time difference, and I'm just drowning my sorrows at this point. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm just getting drunk now. I'm just drinking beer because I'm just gonna. We're not. They, how can we get through against this Ajax team who have had this brilliant tournament? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I'm starting to see there's a big correlation between alcoholism and being a Spurs fan. So I'm I'm in LA by myself watching the Spurs game, and then the second half rolls around, Moore gets one. I'm thinking, okay, okay, something something can happen here. Then he gets another. That second goal was a joke, and then yeah. Um, it was and then he just, just runs over to the corner and you see Potts like crying, everyone going nuts. Obviously Spurs in the Champions League final. That is just yeah. crazy. Like, I, I don't know if you ever thought that would happen in your lifetime. I don't mm. know if you were out there or I don't know where you watched it, but w- one thing I took from that game was I was so, I felt so sorry for Lu- for Mora that he didn't start that after everything he'd done. That was a big bone of contention. It was, you know, you play the guy who's 
who's in form. You play your best team. And I, here's the thing, I understand why Poch did it for the mentality because Harry Kane's our star man. He's been our star striker for the past four, four seasons, five seasons, whatever it is. Top goal scorer in the Premier League and for us, he, he's, he's the difference. He's always, he's always been the difference in the team. And he was out, wasn't he? He'd been out for a couple mm. months because of his injury. And this was his first game back. And he's always going to say, I'm fit, I'm ready, I want to play. He doesn't want to turn down the opportunity to play. In my opinion, Mora, you start Mora all day long. You start your team that got that have literally just won you, just come back from the death against a very strong Ajax team. Mm. Do you think there would have been, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but do you think it could have been a different outcome if Mora yeah. had started? Definitely, man. Def- I mean, you know, you play a different team, there's always going to be a different outcome. Um, mm. It's like sod's law, but I, I just think he was just so on fire and so in form and he would have been full of so much confidence. He would have been walking on air after mm. scoring that hat-trick because he knows in his mind he single-handedly saved the team. And mm. when you have that energy of however many fans it is in the stadium, tens of thousands of fans screaming your name and shouting and, and just just pouring pure adulation and joy upon you, that affects you, man. That's just mm-hmm. energy poured into you. So if you're walking around with your chest out and you're confident and you're going into the Champions League final, you're saying, we've done it before. I can do it again. It's one game. Any, once it gets to the final, it's just one game. Anyone can win. It's just one game. No aggregates, no nothing. It's one game and we can win it. So yeah, uh, me personally, obviously, I'm, no, I'm not a manager, but I'm still a fan and I've got an opinion and I I would have started more and brought yeah. Harry Kane on maybe in the 60th if there wasn't any, if nothing was happen, happening. And I said, would have given him his half, half an hour and say, go on, make, make a difference. This is where you become, mm. this is where you become a true legend. Let's talk about Potts then, because obviously Potts, Potts transformed, transformed Tottenham. He transformed the club. Mm. He made them, he made them European, you know, not, not giants as such, but to come to a mm. European final, put mm. you on the map made you the mm-hmm. club you are right now was you sad to see him go yeah I was sad to see him go I was sad to see him go you know he um before him I think our best team that I've seen in, in my lifetime anyway was the one with you know Modric, Bell, Van der Vaart mm. that team was wicked man I think Carl Walker was, was Crouch. playing for us there Crouch was there wasn't he Crouch the foe you know what I mean like it was a yeah. it was a Lennon it was it was a a decent squad, man. I think we even still had Lady King at that time. It was a, it was a, it was a good squad, but you know, we got into the quarterfinals. I think that's when Bell really put himself on the map. Inter Milan. Inter Milan. We scored the hat trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just insane. Just incredible. I remember when he got pushed pushed up from left back into a winger, and everyone was like, well, "What's Harry Redknapp doing?" But boy, did it pay off, man! Because you know, he went on to become one of the best wingers in the world. Mm. Uh, world record transfer but anyway that was the best team I'd seen until Poch came on board and the team that Poch took over you saw like I think we had like Adi Bayor up front we had like Steven Pienaar um, on the wing yeah it just it, just uh, Bob basic it, players it, it? It, was, it was it was like a tired team do you know what I mean but the team which he made us into over the next few seasons where you saw that best Tottenham squad I've ever seen, where you've got like Harry Kane up front in his prime, Son, Ericsson, Deli Alley. World Cup got, winner in Lloris as well. Got Lloris, a World Cup winner. You've got Moussa's, um Dembele, who in my opinion was, he was my favourite. He was one of my favourite players. So Moussa underrated. Dembele. So criminally underrated. He just like, he couldn't lose the ball. Every single time, it was like he had it on a string. Every single time you thought he was going to lose it, he'd just like Cruyff turn or spin out or just he'd use his body and he'd be, and he'd find the pass. It was brilliant, brilliant. I don't understand why we sold him, but that's a whole nother thing. And then you had... Um, what, against with Dembele? With Dembele. I think we had Eric Dyer. I think he was playing Eric Dyer. Yeah. When Eric Dyer had a wicked, he had like one wicked season. Yeah. I think that's in the lead up to the Euros. I think that was like 2017. Yeah. He had, so he had, yeah. And then you've got Danny Rose and Carl Walker right back. 
and then um, Patongan and Amber Vera of the world. Like, it's a ridiculous team. What he and, and that's Poch who built that team. You know what I mean? Investing in the young players, giving them time, making them fit. That was the thing I remember reading about a lot at the beginning. It was how the training schedules he would give them all, the, the players, you know what I mean? To, to start that, he was the one who kind of was the first ones to do that high intensity, fullbacks very high up the pitch, you know, like defenders on the half, basically on the halfway line. Yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of suffocated teams, which is what you see Liverpool doing so well now, you know, um, with their fullbacks basically playing as wingers. Um, so, yeah, man, that, that I just have so much respect and a lot of love for Pochettino for what he did for Spurs. And you can tell he loves Spurs. You, mm. you know, I think he said in interviews that he, he's got unfinished business and he would one day like to come back. And that shows you what type of man he is, you know. It shows you that he's, you know, loyal to his players and he's a, a good manager and obviously a good person. And I would welcome Poch back anytime, man. I think he's brilliant. But, you know, in Jose Mourinho, like, we've got a serial winner. He wins everywhere he goes. And if he can't win anything at Spurs, <laughs> 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 then it get might him out. show it get him out. It might show you where the problem is. Um Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's what the mindset was with Daniel Levy, because obviously you've had Spurs have had everything but a trophy. And I think if whether yeah. that be the League Cup or Whatever mm. it is, you just need to secure that first bit of silverware, innit? Definitely, man. It is just so it's it's so important because you know, history remembers the winners at all times. Remember the winners, even then, even in punditry, when you see people like Rio Ferdinand or Frank Lampard or whoever, when they come on and do their you know guest uh, punditry in the little graphic underneath, it says World Cup winner or it says mm, four so times true. Champions League winner or four times uh, uh, Premier League winner. You know what I mean? And then you Alan get someone Sh- like David Moyes jumping on it says, was it in a <laughs> semi-final of a League Cup in 1982 or something? <laughs> yeah, once played against Buffon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it goes to show because you, when Alan Shearer's graphic comes up, it says all-time Premier League goal scorer, 260 goals. Do you know what I mean? That's an individual accomplishment, which he's done, but he never won the Premier League. He never won Champions League. You know what I mean? And that is almost what's better. You know, are you remembered as a great striker or are you remembered as a winner? Mm. And I think most people would say it was better to be win, win silverware. It's, it's always nice to be the best, to have your own personal records, but, you know, when you hang your boots up, you want to be able to look at your medals and, so I won this, you know what I mean? I was the best at, at one point. I won it. We were the best. So, um, yeah, man, I think the silverware is a must in the, in the coming seasons. Otherwise, it will start to get a bit sticky from Mourinho. But, you know, I just don't see his long-term plan for Spurs. Like, I see, I saw Pochettino's when he came in. He was doing a rebuild straight up. And he was using young players and he was focusing on the fitness. And you were like, yeah, this is something I can get behind and be patient with. Whereas Mourinho, I don't know, he kind of plays his cards close to his chest, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Obviously, very intelligent, serial winner. But, boy, I just, I, I don't know. I'm not like 100% sold on, on Mourinho yet. I guess that will talk to me in a couple years. And if we've won something, then you'll have my answer. So, hopes for the future then, for Tottenham Hotspur? Hopes for the future. Where do you, where do you realistically see Spurs, and where do you want to be in, let's say, five years? Uh, obviously, I'd like to ask for us to win the Premier League, man, and the Champions. I think that's possible in the next five years. Yeah, yeah, I do. Interesting. Well, as a Spurs fan, it's the hope that kills you. Yeah, and having come close, and you know, not not won anything of like big uh, significance in my lifetime seeing my team win it you're always going to hope that you win it course, you're always, man, yeah. you always have to say that yes we can you know what I mean because I do believe in the players I do believe that Harry Kane is the best one of the best if not the best striker in the league um, I do believe that Son is so dangerous on his day I do so believe good. that Dele Alli is just so naturally gifted and brilliant you know what I mean um and Virold and Vertonghen, whether they stay or go, I don't know. 
they're, but they're just so usually so solid. We've got a good squad, man. It's not as good as that, you know, 17 18 squad which we spoke about. Mm. Um, because the play, the you know, the players are getting a bit older. But yeah, man, I think we can. But here's the thing: I have a feeling that Daniel Levy might sell Spurs. He's got this brand new stadium where he's, you know, chucked all this money into. So he can't spend big and he can't compete with teams like Chelsea and Manchester United in terms of like buying big money players. Yeah. Um, but he does have this amazing stadium. He's got Jose Mourinho as his manager and he's got Harry Kane as his striker. So that as a package to sell to, I don't know, some mega rich star who's like, you know, taken over your Newcastles and taken over your cities. That can happen to Spurs and definitely we can win something in the next yeah. five years. It looks you know, good on like, paper, doesn't it? It does. It's a good sell, do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, th- I think that may be something which could possibly happen. But um, I don't know. That's just all, that's all guesswork. You don't know mm. until you know. But with the team we've got now, I don't think we can win the Premier League. I don't. And yeah. we, c- we could maybe win the Champions League. We got into the final with the same team last uh, Last year, didn't we? Stranger things have happened, mate. Stranger won, things have Leicester happened. Leicester won the fucking Premier League. Leicester won the Premier League, but here's the thing with Leicester: when Le- the te- Leicester team went out, you could name their first eleven before the team sheet was put out. Yeah. Every single match, you knew who was playing where, and there's such a strength to that in a team. Liverpool squad Liverpool, now. Yeah. You can do that with this Liverpool squad because they've got the same team which they put out every week. Well, they were putting out before COVID. Um, every, every week it doesn't change because you know if it's working don't mess with a good thing that's you know more to the point of why Pot should have played uh, <laughs> more of yeah. Okay, yeah so this is something I've been ending with at the end of each episode mm-hmm. obviously you're an actor we're all actors so I want to ask you a little question right yeah you have the opportunity to play any footballer past or present in a let's say, Hollywood biopic of their life, right? On the big screen. Right. I want to know who you're playing and mm-hmm. why. It's got to be Diego Maradona. Oh, hi. I can see the cast in there as well, you know. <laughs> I can see it a little bit. Frizzy, frizzy out the hair a little bit. Yeah, maybe. You know what I mean? I'll have to shrink a couple of inches as well. Why Maradona? Because of the man. Not just to have how brilliant he was, you know. I think as an actor, you've got to look at the character. It's always character. Oh, yeah, of course. The story, See, isn't it? Yeah, this, that's, that's what's chief for me, you know. It's the, it's the character. Who is this guy? And I think the reason why he'd be so fun to play is not only was he considered the best footballer of all time, um, not only was he just so brilliant and so ahead of his game, so amazing. I think it was um, Platini who said the things that he could do with a football, Diego Maradona could do with an orange. He was just so brilliant. Like There's this one video of him doing the kick-ups with his knees, then kicking the ball 50 yards yeah. in the air, and then just doing kick-ups and kicking the ball 50 yards in the air. He was just brilliant, man. So that's one aspect of it, obviously, because obviously, he was so talented. But then you've got this whole other thing with his life and his playboy lifestyle and his character outside of the game think about how much fun that would be you know what i mean oh, world yeah. record transfer twice once to um barcelona and then to napoli and then there's all these conspiracy theories about how napoli even afforded to pay for that like they had mob ties and apparently it was dirty money and obviously the president of Napoli hated when the press asked that and I think he nearly came to blows with a few of them like wherever Maradona went there was like controversy mm. he was a, he's a very polarizing player in terms of uh not his skill because you cannot deny that but his personality even even Argentinian f- uh fans are split by him do you know what I mean uh just because of how controversial he is and I think yeah. that's what makes him so interesting I think I, I don't really I don't really like fence sitters I think if I think if you do you authentically, then you're gonna piss fifty percent of the people off anyway. Yeah. But the other fifty percent of people are gonna love you for it because you're genuine and you're you. You know what I mean? The British side in me is like stinging because of the whole hand of God thing. But yeah, yeah. 
even that man, do you know what I mean? That would like, definitely be in the film, 100%. That would have to be. But then after that, he went and dribbled past the whole squad and scored in, like one of the best goals of yeah. the World Cup ever. Do you know what I mean? Like he, this is what I'm talking about with like the tale of two people, like the Jekyll, the Jekyll and Hyde, which would be so interesting to, to get into. So it, it would have to be Maradona. You'd have some mad scenes in like after parties, like after You'd games. You'd be in like... some dingy little bar with like lines, mountains of cocaine and strippers, yeah. tequila and beer. And then he's going, he's got, he's got a game the next day and he scores a hat trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Do you know what? Yeah, I think, correct me if I'm wrong and anyone listening, correct me if I'm wrong after, I'm going to probably look at it anyway. But Aguero's kid, yeah, because Aguero's going out with Maradona's daughter Yes. And so Aguero's kid, his dad is Aguero, his granddad's Maradona and his godfather's Messi. Messi. <laughs> Imagine the pressure. No pressure, kid. Fucking you know, hell. He's, he's going to... Uh, he, he might be a bit like me, like how oh, my brother and my dad was all good footballers, but I had no tech. Imagine if he has no tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> his, his, I don't know who would be... His would probably be worse, isn't it? <laughs> but instead of, instead of getting... Instead of travelling to South London and kicking the ball on the side, he's going to the Etihad and just like yeah, sitting exactly. in boxing. Exactly, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh mate. mate. Yeah, I know who I'd rather be. <laughs> yeah, mate. He's got a future ahead of him now, bro. Let me tell you that. Most definitely. Good luck to the the kid, man. Good luck. Yeah, good luck to the kid. Most definitely. But no pressure. You've got to do you. You've got to be yourself. He'll probably end up being like a painter or something. (laughs) An artist. (laughs) (laughs) Jacob, mate. Absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast, man. Thanks for jumping on. Charlie. Yeah, man. Anytime, man. I really enjoyed that.